Welcome to the Team Made Apart podcast, the podcast designed to teach freelancers, contractors, and remote workers, really anyone working apart, how to build better relationships with those they work with and those they work for. I'm your host, Ryan Rogar. Before we get started, financial support for the Team Made Apart podcast is provided by R2, a fully distributed brand relationship consultancy. R2 has specific expertise and experience in helping service companies grow, develop, and maintain impactful relationships through world-class brand strategy and design. R2 supports the world's best distributed companies by providing valuable insights, strategy, empathy, and tactical expertise to help them foster truly meaningful relationships from top management to top consumer. If the success of your business depends on the relationships you make, then you need R2. To learn more or to request a call, simply visit r2mg.com slash podcast. That's r2mg.com slash podcast. R2, relationships squared. Also, financial support comes from teammateapart.com. Leveraging 20 plus years of global agency and creative hiring expertise, Teammate Apart provides distributed organizations with access to the best and brightest creative talent from around the world. Through deep understanding of client needs and meaningful relationships with talent, Teammate Apart facilitates a sort of virtual handshake between prospective employer and prospective employee to reduce risk and eliminate doubt from creative hiring decisions. Take a step towards filling that creative-shaped void in your distributed team by visiting teammateapart.com slash talent. That's teammateapart.com slash talent to learn more. Finally, financial support comes from supporters like you. Members of our happy little podcast community can make contributions directly to the show by visiting teammateapart.com slash podcast and clicking on the donation link. Donations can be made in any amount and would go a long way towards keeping this show on the air. If you appreciate the work we're doing and would like to get involved, just visit teammateapart.com slash podcast, click the donate button, and you're on your way. Thanks in advance for your continued support. And now, on to the show. Welcome back to the Team Made Apart podcast. Today's special guest is Kaleem Clarkson. Kaleem is a husband, father, remote work advocate, people operations professional, and speaker. He is the chief operating officer of Blend Me Inc., a remote employee experience consultancy that helps startups and small businesses onboard, engage, and retain their remote teams. Further, he is the founder of Remotely One, a members-only community for remote work professionals, which is fighting isolation by connecting individuals with other location-independent professionals. With more than 20 years of people ops and event planning experience, Kaleem has become a well-known personality in the remote work space. In addition to his routine appearances on the pages of well-known publications from Harvard Business Review to Forbes, his various podcast interviews and keynotes, he hosts a very popular weekly program, Remote Work Wednesdays, on the new Clubhouse app, featuring some of the best and brightest in remote work discussing a topic of the day. Here to chat about the importance of trust and how to foster it on remote teams, how to build meaningful and sustainable relationships when working virtually, and how to use both of those things to build a diverse and inclusive company culture. Please join me in welcoming to the show our guest, Kaleem Clarkson. Hey, Kaleem, how are you, my friend? I am doing very well. Thank you so much for that unbelievable intro. Appreciate Absolutely. That. I hope I didn't blow too much smoke. <laughs> and then also the uh, the little plug for the clubhouse. I mean, obviously, I attend your Wednesday sessions. So if anybody's going to be called the best and the brightest, by God, it's going to be me. <laughs> Thank you so much. Really, Absolutely. Really well, hey, Kaleem, can we start? Um, I've been trying to ask this season where people are calling in from. You know, let's really push this remote work thing. So where are you calling okay. in from today? I'm calling from Atlanta, Georgia. Awesome. Yes, I am. Atlanta, Georgia. Although I represent the 207, the state of Maine, that's where I'm from. Um, <laughs> I, live in, I live in Atlanta, Georgia now. I've been here 13 years. Love the weather. Oh, that's awesome. I love it. Well, cool. So let's talk a little bit. I mean, obviously you heard a little bit in the introduction, but Kaleem, let's uh, just talk yeah. a little bit about who you are, what you do and what we're doing here. Yeah. So um, my partner and I, we started uh, Blimmy Inc. in 2013. I um, think uh, we, we thought that remote work was really interesting back then. And 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 really, I, 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 think, uh, I think we can all now agree that it has some challenges, but at the end of the day, um, it can really help you with with work life integration. So, yeah, we started in 2013. My partner, she's the CEO of the company, and um, outside of talking about remote work and other things, I like the mountain bike and maybe listen to a little 
little metal music while I do it, I guess. Yeah, that's awesome. As I was doing some <laughs> research for the show, I heard that you were in a uh, death metal band or, or some sort of metal band at some point, and I think that's pretty oh, fantastic. A little bit. That's a little awesome. Bit back in college, it was fun. Nice. Fun yeah, no, from, I don't know, 16 till my mid-20s, I used to road manage a bunch of bands out of California, and so I spent a lot of time in the music biz, too. In fact, my remote work career began in the back of a tour bus, so I was doing concert posters at the time, and uh, eventually yes, I had to charge yes, for it. talked about that. Yeah, yeah, so anyway, it was a good time. So but uh, so let's talk a little bit about just how you got into remote work. I mean, have you always been in, in the space, or, I mean, did you get a job that led you down this path, or how'd that work? Yeah, I mean... Where it all started is, is um, you know, in a previous life, I worked as the director of operations and strategic initiatives for a faculty development center at, at Kennesaw State University. And, you know, I was trying to become a web developer at the same time. And I, um, I'm heavily involved in the Drupal community still. So shout out to Drupal. Um, to, for those that you don't know, it's a open source platform like WordPress where you can build web web pages and other uh, applications. Lots of big companies use it. Um, Whitehouse.gov used to use it, uh, the Weather Channel, et cetera. So I was out doing a conference at DrupalCon Denver in 2012, and um, Matt Westgate from a company called Lullabot, who um, the Grammys were their client at the time, was talking about how they are a fully distributed company. And I never heard that term. Uh, he was talking, he was showing pictures about how his company doesn't have an office and how they didn't want to use the term virtual because he didn't want, you know, their, their clients to feel like that they want a real company. Um, and he didn't want to use the word remote because people felt distant. So it was just an interesting thing. I never, never really thought about companies who, who don't have offices. And, you know, when they were showing pictures of all their employees all over the place, it really, really grabbed my attention. So just like, a lot of things, I, you know, I'm a lifelong learner, uh, started reading books, read the book remote, read the book, uh, the year without pants, then, <laughs> then the four hour work week. And really it was, I think it was the four hour work week that, 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 um, really kind of opened my eyes as far as what, what you're really attracted to. And the idea of, of not being, I, I think he said something along the lines of, of most people are think that they're attracted to rich, the, the money, but you're actually attracted to the freedom and, and the, their ability to go do things whenever they want. And I found that fascinating of, of the idea of being able to work, but not being attached to a location. So um, again, my partner had just graduated from UConn in 2010, a couple of years before that, and, and um, with her master's degree in human resources and organizational development. And we were just like, why don't we just start an HR company specifically for remote company, for remote companies? And here we are today. Yeah, no, I love it. Well, and I think one of the things I like the most about you, Kaleem, is that you and I bond a lot over sort of our, you know, mutual interest in things that have to do with sort of, I don't know, the, the warm fuzzies, the relationships, the empathy, the trust, mm -hmm. you know, all these kinds of things. And, you know, that's been our message really from the beginning is how do we build better relationships remotely? And, uh, and, and you and I have sort of found some common ground on that stuff too. So I'm really excited to have this conversation, but what I wanted to lead yeah. with is maybe one of the hottest things that's happening right now in the, in the field of remote work. And hopefully it's still a popular comment by the time this show airs here in, in, a, in about three weeks. But I think that the, um, there's, there's this big movement, right? We're starting to maybe see a downward trend in COVID cases. We're starting to hopefully be recovering from this thing. The economy mm -hmm. is starting to, to ramp back up. And one of the yeah. things that's happening is now businesses are saying, hey, I'm going to reopen my office. I want to go back to work. And, uh, you know, we're seeing some studies start to emerge about how people feel about this. And there's this idea of this mandatory return to office. You know, everybody is, is handling things differently. But, you know, there's a, a big contingent of sort of what we would call sort of the dinosaurs or the, the older version, the people who are managing in maybe a more antiquated way. And, uh, and they're really interested in just, you know, let's get back to the way things were. Let's get back into the office. And so I thought mm. maybe you and I could have a little conversation about this idea of mandatory uh, return to work and see what you thought. Yeah, I mean, you know, we've, we've talked about this a little bit offline, too. And I just, this idea of back to the office required. So keep, keep that phrase in mind, because we're going to be writing a, a series of blogs on this, because... I feel like there's this, this tension right now, right? And there's this, 
tension between employers and employees behind the requirement to come back to the office. And, you know, regardless of whether you are for returning to the office or, or not for returning to the office, um, I feel like making it required just goes against everything that we've learned, right? Um, obviously, you and I, Ryan, we, we've been doing remote work for a little bit. So, you know, more power to all the new people who've experienced it. I'm not, not you know, taking that away from anyone. But uh, this has been this has been happening for years, even before us. Yeah. So well, and it's interesting, um, you know. I think that there is yeah. a a disconnect that exists, right? I mean, obviously, yeah. a, communication is a two way street. As mm-hmm. folks in the mm-hmm. remote work industry, like you and I, I mean, obviously you know, we, we really come to appreciate the importance of, of good two-way communication, right? Because it's critical for right. remote teams, you know, regardless of mm. synchronous, asynchronous, whatever, any of these fancy words you want to use, you know, bottom line is we need to be communicating ideas and we need to be doing so with regularity, but just like in real life, right? Between you and a partner or you and a friend or you and your mother, you know, if there's too big, a di- too big a gap between what you want and what you're communicating, you know, then you're sort of opening yourself up to to some funky territory. And I'm going to I'm going to look down here while I cite the study. But basically what we're looking at is, you know, based on some recent studies, and I saw one as recent as today that was a little anecdotal, but basically the results were the same. Uh, you know, 32 percent of people are trying to go remote only 39 percent are interested in some sort of hybrid situation, leaving only 29 percent that actually want to go back to work 100 percent of the time. And I've seen numbers, you know, even lower than that, you know, in the in the eight and ten and five percent that are, are actually looking to go back. And uh, and so I wonder what your thoughts are on sort of this mismatch between, you know, what people seem to want and what are the needs or the wants or the, you know, whatever of the employer. Yeah, yeah. And I'd also like to, to add to that that um shout out to buffer the 2021 state of remote work has an an even crazier stat of 97 percent of people want to work remotely at least part of the time for the rest of their career like and 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 to me that number is 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 very high and for organizations to and then further down in that you see organizations i believe it was 46% 46% of the organizations are going to allow some sort of remote work plan. Yeah. And then the other 50, whatever, aren't sure or are not going to. And to be successful in remote work, um, we always, you know, when we created kind of this, this, this assessment, the remote employee experience uh, assessment, trust is the first pillar on um successfully implementing remote work. You have to assume trust. You have to, you know, that that phrase trust is earned. Well, in this case, you actually have to start with some assumed trust first until, you know, you're proved wrong. And to me, this tension that we're talking about is literally the opposite of trust. You know, you have, I mean, we just talked about the stats. You have employees saying, this is what I want. And then you have employers saying, come back to the office. I've, like, I've heard what you had to say, but we're not even going to address what you had to say. So to me, I just feel like, you know, for companies to make back to office required after what we've gone through, I just, can't, I wish I could comprehend it because I can't understand how organizations believe that requiring people to come back to the office after this, the last 12 months, I just don't have any words. I I wish I could understand how they could believe that it's going to work. Well, you know, and it's funny, even in the way that we're bringing it up, right. Or the way that we're framing this conversation, this idea of mandatory or required, you know, I think that concept of, you know, whip cracking is, is very, you know, condescending for one, but I mean, it's also archaic. It's, it's not how you deal with teams these days. And I try to be object, uh, objective and I understand, you know, businesses have their, their needs too. Right. And I think it's, you know, you don't want the students running the school necessarily, right. You still have to have some leadership and you still need to have some, some people in charge. So yeah, sure. Your employees want this, but maybe for one reason or another, your business can't do it or whatever. But more often than not, the excuses I hear are sort of fear-based, 
you know, it's, it's back to this idea of trust. It's, it's, you know, we don't inherently trust you, which I mean, tells me you don't trust the people you're hiring, which means you're making not great hiring decisions. <laughs> so, so I think there's sort of a, you know, a fruit of the poisonous tree there, I think. But, um, but ultimately I think, you know, it does boil down to this trust. And I think that it's a fear thing that we're trying to overcome. And the idea of it being so, you know, black and white or so just flippant that we're not, we're not going to go back. And that's that, uh, you know, seems a little bit counterintuitive. Hmm counterintuitive i mean yeah especially especially when you're talking about we've been doing this for 12 months you know i i i think that is the biggest piece that that is going to be really challenging for a leader and especially for small businesses and we've you know we've talked about some people believe it's going to hurt small businesses if everyone goes remote you know because no one's going to be in those areas and blase blase but hey everyone likes to eat um, the other thing is we talk about is right now is not the correct time to assess how remote work is going to play out because we're in the middle of a lockdown. I mean, hey, I used to go to a co-working spot that was downtown because I liked the energy and I would go to the restaurants there. So, you know what I mean? Like, 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 like it's a very difficult thing. The other thing that I have a really, really tough time with um, is that many organizations do not uh, gauge uh, their culture. They do not measure their culture. They do not measure how well um, their organization is engaged. Now, the, the organizations that do do that very well, you know, they could come out and have some data. Like, look, we we surveyed our company and, you know, engagement has gone down. Our culture, people are feeling it. Um, and if you have that data that's showing that and production's down, if you have that data, then, then, Okay, it's a good it's a good reason. Maybe your company is set up that way, you know, that you can do that. Yeah. But for the most part, Ryan. Well, you know, we I think that that's a, well, and companies I, aren't measuring it. Yeah, you're. I think you know? you're right, and I think that's a great point, actually, because I think you know when people, or at least the criticism I see, you know, on LinkedIn and places like that, you know, you you've got some remote work advocate that's all gung ho remote work. And then he's mm -hmm. pitching some idea that seems new or strange or, or, you know, whatever. And I think, you know, just like we're talking about the all or nothing on the, the business end, you know, I think people perceive the way these advocates come at remote work as being all or nothing too. And I think it's Laurel Ferrer that, that really said this to me that in a way that stuck, but it was this idea that it's not about, you know, remote work being the future. It's about flexibility being the future, right? It's be able to work where you mm -hmm. can be most productive. And so, but to your point, this idea that if you've actually collected data that shows, hey, our, our line of work or our type of business, or maybe our leadership can't hold up to doing a great job remotely. And as a result, we can't stay remote. Like it just doesn't work for our, organi our organization. Like, I think that's totally a fair idea versus just coming to the table and saying, well, you know, we just got to get back in the office. We rent this big old place for you guys and you got to come hang out. Right. And, and, and that's the other thing too. It's like, don't, don't come up with these fake stats, number one stats that don't exist, were you assessing your culture correctly? I think that's the other piece. Were you assessing your culture correctly prior to the pandemic? And do you, you know, because, you, you know, with statistics, you need an A, B. We all talk about A, B testing all the time, right, in the tech space. If you don't have an A or a B, then I really don't know what leadership's going to use for legitimate reasoning to bring everyone back that's going to build trust. You know, we're talking about trust and, 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 and gaining empathy. The first thing, the first thing you want to do to erode trust is to just tell people to do it and don't worry about it because we're telling you to do it. Like yeah. that is, that's, that's the beginning way to, to, to start eroding trust right there. So, yeah, well, and it's funny too. I think it's probably, I mean, it's obviously a misconception, but I think people hear that, you know, oh, I want to work remote and that translates in some leaders' minds to, oh, well, I just want more time off or, you know, I don't want to come to the office. I want to work in my pajamas or whatever. But one of the factors that I think is still maybe being a little bit overlooked is that, you know, for at least a small percentage of these people who are interested in staying remote, they might still be scared of this whole COVID thing. And maybe they're not interested in being in an office with a bunch of people who might get them sick. And just like anything else, if you, if you feel like you're unsafe at work, why should you be forced to be there? Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you have, you have the safety situation. The other thing is, is we have families. I mean, tons of people have reevaluated what's important to them in life. And, you know, for myself, my partner and I, we had the experience to be able to go to Maine for three months and, 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 
be around our in-laws where we couldn't have been around them before. And it changed us. I mean, you can't, you can't deny that, that people have reevaluated what's important to them. And for organizations to just totally ignore that, um, it, it just doesn't make good business sense. And you know what? Let me tell you this. If you're a small business, there's also another piece to remote work that people are not um, talking about. And, and I love the fact that Laurel kind of brought up that, that piece of all or nothing. But let me ask you this. What were to happen if um, Company A in the Northeast a few weeks ago had this huge blizzard and you had no remote work, right? You had no remote work implemented. You know, I'm from the North. I remember school day, uh, snow days, love snow days. Shut the school right down. You know what they do now? Um, work from snow's home. coming up tomorrow. S- snow's coming up tomorrow. There's not going to be a school day. You're going to be a snow day. You're going to be doing school school from home. Now, for some of you kids, I know that's not great. I love <laughs> snow days. I understand this. I've seen some people say, oh, our kids are never going to get snow days. Okay, I get that. But remote work is a really, really, really smart disaster contingency plan. Yeah. You know, every business needs to have a disaster contingency plan. Yeah. So I had a conversation recently uh, for this podcast, actually, with a guy named Chris Dyer, and he was talking yesterday about a meeting type they have where they it's called a, a tsunami meeting. And basically in these tsunami meetings, what they do is they come up with a fantastic uh, you know, emergency or situation or scenario or something that what if this happened to our business, how would we survive? You know, and it could be, what if our CEO got hit by a bus? It could be, what if we had an extended power outage? It could be whatever. Right. But to your point, Mm -hmm. without stopping and thinking about that stuff, you know, not, not too far from just, you know, getting under your desk and learning how to do a fire drill, right. Or get, you know, an earthquake drill in the schools, you know, Mm -hmm. I mean, even though there may never be an earthquake, that little bit of preparedness is really valuable. And I think to your point, this idea of having remote work as an option, you know, even if it's not your full-time modality, but Hey, I've got to go out of town or, Hey, I'm having a baby or, Hey, you know, uh, so-and-so is out with something or, you know, whatever for those people to then be able to just sort of pick up the mantle and work from home, uh, because you've already built the infrastructure, you've already opened up the communication channels, you've already built all this stuff. You know, I mean, what a, what a great opportunity. And, and you know, should there be an a, a emergency or maybe even not an emergency, just a need to close the office, toilets flooded, you know, everybody yeah. can keep work going. And actually, it ends up being better for you in the long run. I mean, absolutely. I mean, just think about, you have Cal- we're always going to have natural disasters. You know, I, you know, you, know um, you remember in the entertainment biz back in the day in the contracts, and they probably still put these in the contract, right? Act of God. Um, the only... The act of God. <laughs> and, and, and if the act of God happens, that's the only way that you don't have to pay the artist. That's right. right. Well, it's a very slim definition of, of what force majeure <laughs> is, by the way, they, they try right, very right. hard not to, not to pay. <laughs> it's very, very difficult to, 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 to prove. But um, the point is, you know, there were wildfires in California, you know, there's blizzards, there's floods. These things are going to continue to happen. And if you're a small business, the, the thing that, you know, I'm really, really trying to preach is there are a lot of small businesses out there that do not want to adopt um, remote work for whatever reasons. And I'm talking about family businesses, the the blue collar industries. Um, I have a colleague who's in third party logistics, who's, you know, trucking, it's, it's trucking, it's in that, you know, work hard, we all got to be together type feel. And they're fully, they've been fully remote um, since, since like March or April. And, you know, they're located in Massachusetts. And, and just thinking about the idea of, you know, him talking about, well, hey, if, if something were to happen, at least my office, you know, the people who are in um, the Midwest, they can continue to work and, and you can still do your business. And for a small business, one or two or three days of not being able to work is a lot more impactful and, and can, can, can hurt your business than a big corporation. So in a weird way, this, this remote work and disaster contingency it's kind of more important for these smaller companies, you know, because how long can you hold on without, you know, you have a, a crazy blizzard or something like that. How yeah. long can you hold on without working? Well, and that's a great point. And also just the fact that, you know, should something happen in your small business, 
you know, I mean, it's infinitely easier to install remote work policies and stuff like that among your nine or 10 employees or, or, you know, whatever you have, you know, than it is for, you know, I don't know, one of these, you know, mega companies to do it. You right. know, I mean, it's, right. it's a, not a difficult process and it's a great emergency contingency to keep you safe and keep you doing business. You know, you know, God forbid it's just the weather, but I mean, you know, it could be something worse like, you know, COVID 20, you know? Right. So it's a, right. yeah. So I think that that's a, a great point. And then not to mention, you're a small business and your competitor small business or competitor in the industry is offering workplace flexibility. Like as a company, if you're out here saying back to the office required, do not kid yourself. Do not kid yourself. If you don't think that people are not going to, yeah, they'll go back to the office. But don't, do not kid yourself if you don't think people are going to be looking for new jobs. Well, yeah, while they're at the office, they're going to be while on uh, Indeed while or they're... Monster.com looking for work. So, <laughs> yeah, no, I, th- I think, well, yourself. and I think that's a great point, too, even just as a differentiator going forward, right? I mean, so the companies that, you know, I mean, there are people that just want to be in the office and that's going to be their thing. And that's fine. I mean, remote yeah, work course. doesn't need to be your solution. So, but I think it's going to give, you know, some companies, you know, this flexibility anyway, will give some companies a competitive advantage when it comes to hiring talent and things like that. And I think that that's going to be one of the big boons that comes out of this, right? Is the people who got really good at remote work really fast, you know, they're going to have more opportunity available to them. You know, the folks that, you know, sort of drug their feet and were just looking to go back to the office and get back to normal and kind of move on those folks are not going to be as equipped. You know, they didn't adapt as quickly as some of these other people. And so as, you know, the job market evolves and flexibility becomes a part of work and, you know, you've got your big Airbnbs or whoever it are that that are selling out of their leases and going fully remote and stuff like this. I mean, you Mm -hmm. might work for a company that just decides, hey, remote's going to be our new thing, man. This worked out okay. I'm sorry you didn't like it, but that's the new thing. And so, so just like you might not have wanted to return to the office, you know, this person might not want to go remote. But you bring up a good point, which is, you know, and I, and I like it at least in terms of sort of optimism and, and, you know, I guess empowerment, this idea that there are more fish in the sea, there are more jobs. So if you're not happy in your situation or with your status, you know, if you're not feeling trusted, respected, listened to, then go find another job. There's, there's other opportunities, you know, and maybe that's not true in every country and maybe it's not even true right now, given sort of the state of our economy. But I think generally speaking, you know, those who are diligent, you know, will find work. Yeah. Yeah. And I also think one of the, one of the things that you can't underestimate and you can't look over, right? Right now, there's really no, you know, some of the high school sports are kind of happening, but not really. Um, so the need for flexibility, it's still there right now, of course, because, you know, you have some parents who need to, you know, homeschool because of whatever, um, We've had to do that too. That's a challenge. But just imagine, like we did a, um, my partner and I, we did a presentation for the Association of Legal Administrators. And I could tell in the presentation that there was all the administrators, uh, you know, chief marketing officers, chief, chief operating, IT staff, most of them want to continue to work remotely. But then we had a lot of lawyers and partners, you know, who were very hesitant and wanted everyone to get back to the office. So again, we had this, this natural conflict. And what we heard about was like, well, when we get back to, you know, uh, I'm not going to say when we get back to normal, what can we say when we get back to being able to get together again, (laughs) um, there's going to be more uh, uh, need for flexibility. I was listening to this one uh, paralegal talk about, wow, I've been able to, you know, sit with my kid at two o'clock or three o'clock when the school day ends, sit with my mm-hmm. child and ask him how their school day went and, and have these conversations, pick my, my child up at school versus taking the bus. Um, all of these things that, that uh, as a, as a paralegal, they weren't even allowed to necessarily leave early. Oh, I need to go pick up. Oh, we'll, we'll log that time. Yeah. Just, just think about all these tiny little con- controlling mechanisms that people have had in place that now um, are just throwing out the window. There's, there's people are having a ton of more sick time available because I don't need to use the sick time. Right. You know, I don't need to take an hour to go to go to my dentist's office. I don't have to do that. So I just, I just kind of feel like I, I just don't know how we're going to go, go back to the way it used to be yeah. when people have, have people who did not experience this type of life flexibility 
have now all experienced what we've been yeah. working for years. Well, and I think now. even beyond that, you know, I, uh, I, I've been sharing this notion around quite a bit lately, but this idea that I think it pays a little bit of a disservice to everything this country's been through to try to return to what it was. Right. I mean, I think that Thank we've you. been through a really difficult Thank time in you. this country well, and we're in Thank around you. the world. But I think to not take that as a learning experience that makes us better somehow, I think sort of cheapens all the all the bad things done. Right. And so I think that <laughs> yes, it's really right. important that we think about that. And, and also, if you as an as an employer, as a leader, if you can be empathetic to the fact that everybody's lives have gone through some sort of upheaval, maybe it's a job loss. Maybe I had to quit to stay home with my kids. Maybe it's just. I, maybe I always worked from home, but now I have kids and a partner at the house. Maybe, I mean, you know, but everybody's circumstances are different. Maybe I've been out of work for a while. Maybe I couldn't make my mortgage for six months. Maybe, you know, I mean, there, there's so many, such a broad range of things that people are dealing with that to try and say, well, let's just go back to the way it was and sort of, you know, okay, now we're going to go back to the office just like before when you had job security, even though now you don't. And, you know, just yeah, like before yeah. when you were home working alone, but now you have kids and family around. Like, I mean, it, it sort of, I think, discounts the tr the trouble that people have gone through to to be so sort of archaic about this idea that, okay, we're going to do exactly like it was, or, or you're now required yeah. to do X, Y, and Z. I think not giving people that empathy or a little bit of that grain of salt to sort of address what happened, you know, what's happening in life right now, I think uh, pays a disservice to people. You know, I, I guess I, I've never really heard it kind of position in that way, like a, a disservice to what we've gone through. You know, that's a really, that's a really powerful statement. You know, and I think I think that's something that um, if you're listening, I think that's something you should take. If you're going to take <laughs> one thing out of this pod, this podcast it, or a video, it's definitely that. Because when you talk about innovation, organizations were forced to innovate. This wasn't an innovation by choice. This was an innovation by force. Why? Why would you throw away everything that you learned during this phase? Mm -hmm. And then if you want to even talk about going back to the way it used to be, I think you were in this clubhouse discussion and maybe, maybe you heard it or not. Uh, somebody jumped in and talked about, um, we need to look at when the first, the first office was created. Like look at the history of work. And if you think about it a long time ago, where would you go to get your shoe fixed? So the, go to the blacksmith. The blacksmith would, would be, would put the sign above the little house the blacksmith and you would go to the person's house to, to get your stuff fixed. You would, you know, you would go to the doctor's office in their little, their little sign above the house. So at one point of time, we didn't work in an office. Yeah. And then all of a sudden the office was created. So it's, it's almost like we're doing this whole full 360. And everyone's like, we got to get back to the way it used to be. Well, if you really want to get back to the way it used to be. Yeah. You don't well, have to have an office because exactly. people have their own offices <laughs> out of their homes. Well, that's the thing. And I think it's I think it's one of these like human characteristics to try and push back on change. Right. I mean, this happens to everybody, whether it's in a, a good or a bad relationship or a, leaving a job or getting a new job or, you know, whatever it is, having a child or, or anything. Right. I mean, change is spooky and change is hard to work through and change is intimidating. And, you know, back to this idea that employers want to go back to the way it was because of fear, I think makes a lot of sense. Right. I mean, it really is just sort of this fear of change. And I, and I think that this idea and, and you phrased it really well, this idea that, you know, this innovation by force, I mean, what a, what a crappy deal. We spend it, you know, a year, 14 months innovating and now we're just going to, you know, yeah, that was, you know, fun. Okay. Back to, back to business, you know, let's go back to, to Microsoft outlook. We'll call it good. Yeah. You know? we'll call it good. We'll call it good. <laughs> yeah. So I think that, so, that that's a fair point. As far as advice. So we want to give a little bit of value here. We definitely, we could be on our soapboxes all day. And talk about this. <laughs> hey, I, sure, like I love it. That's a, and and I guess one of the things that I, I would like to, to, to kind of provide some advice, I'm putting on my consulting cap here. Um, look, if you want to really do this, two things. First, we realize that, you know what, maybe we don't have to work as hard as we have been working all, all this time. You know what I mean? Like, like some companies are still profitable. We realize mental health is key. So I, I think there's some things that are coming out of this pandemic that are part. I think the focus on on mental health has shifted, or or the focus on people is starting. To, we're starting to see that shift. Um, but like the idea behind um, wellness, 
right? And the idea behind um, your whole self has come out of all of this. Mm -hmm. So if you're an employer and you're like, you know, we have this lease, we're, we're locked into this lease. So I think that's the other thing. Um, we're spending this money, we're locked into this lease. So gosh darn it, we're gonna make use of this space. <laughs> So I understand that you don't want to just waste, throw money away. You want to use the space. What I have been advising people is survey your, your employees first, determine what the definitions of workplace flexibility is. Um, and I would suggest checking out this company called work labs, W E R K L A B S so that you can get on the same page of definitions. Cause I think that's, that's the beginning um, confusion is is a disconnect between what the employer thinks is workplace flexibility versus what the employee thinks. So you got to get them on the same train track first. So check that 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 resource out. Survey your company and get an idea of what they're looking for first, and then try to figure out a way to design your work flexibility based around the data. And then figure out a way that you can utilize your existing workspace to kind of accommodate those needs. Like, be innovative. <laughs> We've you've been innovative. I understand that your office building might have been has been empty maybe for the past twelve months, and you don't want to throw away you know that investment that you had invested in you know long term. But maybe you reconsider how you're going to use that space. So maybe you reconfigure the office to be more of a a conference type space where you can have concurrent sessions and you can have um, more flexible work arrangements where they can, where people can really get there and collaborate. So I, you know, I, I you know, I just want to kind of to, to leave a little piece of advice for people that are listening. I'm like, well, I hear what you're saying. We want to do it. But the reality is, is like, we got this bill that's going to last forever because we don't want to break the lease. or we yeah. don't, you know, we purchased this building years ago. What do we do now? Um, there are some options out there. And, and I guess I would just say, please just, Ask. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing, like we do some work with commercial real estate uh, companies, you know, in, a, in my marketing company, we do work for commercial real estate businesses. And this has obviously been, you know, hot topic for them, right? We're not moving real estate as quickly as we once did. And how can we retrofit uh, properties to to fit whatever's coming next? And I think that, you know, that's a really great idea, this idea of, kind, you know, almost really like a co-working facility, right? I mean, some hot desks and some, you know, maybe a couple pri private places for phone calls and things and conference rooms or event areas where you can do an occasional get together or, you know, that kind of thing. But that, that makes a lot of sense to me for the going forward. One of the things that I've observed and I'm trying to figure out too, and it, and it was sort of a thought triggered by what you were saying is, you know, I, I'm trying to figure out the, you know, you've, you hear stories of Facebook, right? And Facebook is like, Hey, we're going to let everyone go remote but we're going to discount what we pay you based on where you live. Oh. And, and I think that this is kind of a yucky thing. And I think it sort of goes back to, you know, are you really right. buying into remote, right? <laughs> because, because for this me, is a difficult topic. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm not even sure there's a right answer and I'll just preface this. I mean, in case it's not totally obvious, I'm not an economist, so I don't really understand how all this works. <laughs> but what I will say is that it becomes rapidly apparent that we're paying people for their real estate. We're not paying them for the value they bring our company. And so to the point mm. you made earlier and the one that sort of triggered this, this idea of, you know, are people like, what is it we're paying people for? Right. What is, what is right. the, the value right. they're providing? Is it is it that they're sitting in an office in San Francisco or because, I mean, by by this logic, right, we're going to pay you less if you move to Idaho or Utah or something like that. Well, then are you going to pay me more if I get a sweet little loft in downtown downtown Manhattan or something like I mean, are you going to upsell me, too, if I get this sweet pad somewhere? <laughs> like, you know, I might want to go live in Hawaii for a little while. I mean, are you going to pay right. me extra for Hawaii? I mean, so so I don't understand this logic. And so but I think it's a, a, a really critical thing to try and understand, right, is is the value of people and where people are at and the the concept of do we really need a 40 hour work week? You know, I mean, they, I know that there's a lot of, you know, remote advocates and people like that who are constantly constantly citing the industrial revolution and, you know, this is a, mm -hmm. a relic of that and, and all that yeah. stuff. Right. And, uh, I've, I've seen a lot of conversation going back and forth on, on LinkedIn where it's, you know, Hey, you know, we want to go back to the office, but it's just a great place to pad your 40 hour work week, right? You're up at the water cooler, you're talking to your friends, you're, you know, taking right. a long lunch, you're doing whatever you're doing, you're getting your 40 hours, but you know, is it really effective when maybe if you were working remotely, you could work six hours a day, get the same amount of work done and have this extra liberty to enjoy life and spend time with friends and family and build relationships and all that stuff. 
And uh, so I wonder what your take was on sort of that whole mess. The salary thing is so difficult to understand. Um, so my initial, it's, I love the fact you brought this topic up. So for all you listening, we have back to back to work required. That's controversial. And now we have pay me the same no matter where I live, which is also controversial. This is a good, this is a good, you know, debate that you can have with your colleagues. Um, so my first initial gut reaction was pay everyone the same. Like, what are we doing? Like, you know, you've been paying everybody to, to watch them. You've been watching over them. Like, like, you know, is, is my code better because I coded it from New York? Um, I pushed the same code and I coded it from Maine or Iowa. Shouldn't I get paid the same? Um, but the more I look into that, the more I thought about it, the more I realized, I don't know if that's a fair thing to do. Because sometimes you always have to look at unintended consequences of doing things, right? So let's just make pretend everyone decides, you know what, we're going to pay everyone the same no matter, no matter where you live. What do you think is going to happen to the, the cities? Yeah, every, it's going to be mass exodus. Right, right. <laughs> so then, so then, and then you also are going to have companies, and again, the, you know, companies are de designed to make money and profitability is a, is a motivator. You're going to have organizations that are going to no longer hire people from New York and San Francisco. You're going to have organizations that are going to be like, oh, well, why should we do that? We're going to only hire, um, you know, people like, if, again, if, if, if you're going to pay based on um, cost of living and you're going to adjust the pay, they're going to say, well, we're just going to pay. We're going to only hire people from Iowa because it's cheaper there. So we can only we can pay a developer less money. So but then if you pay everyone the same. The question is, okay, are you now penalizing the people that live in high cost areas because you're no longer going to pay them that premium? It is such a difficult problem. And I don't know what the answer is for that because cost of living, the, the truth of the matter is if you make $100,000 in New York and you make $100,000 in Atlanta or $100,000 in Maine, your access to income is is different yeah i mean that, so, that so, 100 grand will get you a puny little apartment in new york city but it'll buy you a nice little spread somewhere out in the midwest right right so then so then what is fair and i just i just don't know what the solution is to that problem because yeah, in you theory know. you should pay everybody the, the, you know um and obviously you shouldn't pay every you know this is a sidebar real quick you probably shouldn't pay everybody the same because you don't want to alienate your top performers so actually paying everybody the same isn't really right. a good thing to do because you want your top performers to make more money than your bottom performers but that's a whole different topic right but well, that's and that's based on remote work yeah you know, like well and that's why i brought this up right is because it's challenge i mean this is one of these these questions that, that is difficult and it does i think i mean it does beg the question you know why aren't we paying people for value anyway <laughs> you know like i mean if you're working for me at at facebook for example and you know yeah your cost of living is higher in san francisco but the value pr you provide the company is less than i'm paying you then it's not working out very equitably for the company and i guess they average that out over the you know the folks who do live out in the midwest or whatever and they can pay, afford to pay a little more for this guy and a little less for that guy and it washes out but but it is an mm. interesting question there's a, a guy named andy triba He's a former Intel exec and a pretty well-known figure in the remote work world. And he has this concept of a cloud wage. And I think about this kind of a lot um, hmm. because I do a lot of work uh, at Teammate Apart with, uh, you know, people in, in disadvantaged parts of the world, you know, bad, bad countries, okay. you know, war-torn areas, things like that. Creative okay. people who are looking for work, right? And again, you know. Mm -hmm sub bar or sidebar. I am not an economist and don't pretend to be, but, um, <laughs> you know, his concept, or at least the concept of this cloud wage is that let's say, for example, I need to have a web project built. I need a website and this website is worth $50,000. No matter what, mm -hmm. no matter where you are, no matter whatever, this thing is a $50,000 object floating in the sky. And if you're in Bangladesh or you're in new Delhi, or you're in, you know, Boise, Idaho, mm -hmm. It's ten, you know, fifty thousand dollars just floating here in this right. cloud, right? And you're able to get equal yeah. access to it, right? But what happens if you have these armies of guys in a country like Bangladesh, where you know, I, I don't even know what the monthly salary is, but I've got to imagine it's very low. And then all of a sudden, they're pulling in these fifty thousand dollar projects. You know, I like that they have equal opportunity, 
but does introducing that much money through an individual in an economy cause problems? You know, I don't really know, but what I like on its face anyway, is sort of the fairness factor, right? Anybody from anywhere can get to this thing. And if you happen to have the skills and you're qualified, then we may choose you, you know? So right. I, I like then, that paying for but merit, then, but and then, paying for value, but what's the long term? I, I do too. But then the question is, okay. Um, as far as the company's concerned, let's just say that there's company A and company B um, and company, company a is in Bangladesh and company B is in the U S uh, but now company A in Bangladesh, they're seeing more profit because they're paying their people less mm -hmm. over there. Right. And although that cloud item is the same, um, the, the results are not the, the, the access to revenue is not the same. It, it because you're gonna like, unless the whole world just decides a dollar is a dollar and you know, everybody is, is worth the same. Um, you're going to have these inequalities. So yeah, I, it's such a difficult thing. I, yeah. I think the best thing that I would, uh, that I'm kind of leaning towards is kind of the, uh, um, the buffer route again, throwing out buffer again, love, love, love what they've been doing is probably the idea of, okay, we need to up the wage enough for somebody to be, um, to live in Manhattan. And then we got to kind of like, bring it down just a little bit um, just so that it's, it's, it's not so high um, and then have some sort of like allowance based on, uh, uh, you know, maybe like an office allowance, like a, you know, per square footage allowance. And I think they have this calculator that determines what your salary is. So like all the positions have the same kind of baseline salary um, based on position, no matter where you live. Yeah. But again, this is all ahead of time. So, you know, this sure. when you apply to the, 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 the location, but then they have another field that gives you a percentage based on, based on cost of living. Yeah. And you know, all of this. So like, if you live in New York, you know, your salary is going to get like, you know, 8% bump because of cost of living. And again, I know it's not fair, but like at least, um, you're seeing that ahead of time yeah. and you know that it's it's open and you know that when you decide to kind of change locations, you know that, you know, your salary can kind of adjust based yeah. on that. Like, well, and that's I, the only thing I could think of. That, yeah. That's well, and I, I like there. that. Right. I mean, obviously as remote advocates, we speak about transparency a lot. And I think, you know, letting people know up front versus, you know, pulling the rug out from somebody is a better approach. Um, you know, and I, and I think, you know, obviously it makes sense. We've got to make some adaptations and stuff. So that sounds like a pretty smart, uh, policy. Um, I don't, I don't know, maybe it ends up being Bitcoin. That's becomes our global currency or something. <laughs> I don't know. Somebody's going to have to figure it out. So, well, Hey, so let's kind of transition back. I feel like, uh, I took you down a funny tangent, but let's go back a little bit to this idea of forced to go back, you know, re uh, return to the office. Um, I wanted to talk about more like, okay, let's say that we've made a compelling case and we've got some high powered CEOs listening to this show and they've softened a little now on their position and they're like, okay, we want to mm -hmm. talk about it. Do you mind talking a little bit about just sort of the, the aspects of culture that then need to be implemented if we're going to start going easy. And, and these could be things like, how do we build better relationships? How do we become truly mm. empathetic? You know, how do, how do we install this new ethos in our company that just until moments ago, until, you know, five minutes ago in this podcast, we were thinking we were going back to the office full time, but now we're rethinking it. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really, really good question. And I think, I think the, the main point that I would like to make you know, to, to kind of answer that is if you haven't been in a growth mindset as, as a leader and as a company or a learning first company, there, there's been all sorts of terms that you've been hearing lately. Um, then you need to really try to, to, to make that shift. So you're a leader and you are like, you know what, I'm, I was going to make everyone go back to the office, but then I heard, I heard Ryan's dope ass podcast and I'm not going <laughs> to do that. Okay. So how, what should I do? Um, um, it's difficult. Change is hard. But the idea of, of always um, learning, always creating kind of a culture of feedback, a feedback culture, a learning first culture, because what those things are, it's more like you switching from being the, uh, the professor in a classroom to being the student. Allow yourself as a leader to be the student 
and encouraged feedback. And what I mean by encouraging feedback is that you can't just do a survey and that's it. You have to think about all the different modalities of feedback that you can utilize to get the pulse. Because the only way that you're going to get empathy, you know, diversity and inclusion, we talk a lot about this, but the only way you can gain empathy is if you can hear someone else's story so you can actually feel what they're feeling. So you have to get in that person's shoes to get their perspective, to gain the empathy from their, from their side. So in order for leaders to do that, you have to really shift your mind from, you know, reactive or, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the professor up in the front telling everybody to like, how can, how can we do this? And you have to really embrace the idea behind all the different modalities of feedback. So open forums, you know, they have a place. Uh, uh, employee resource groups, you know, there's a place for that, you know, as far as, um, you know, allowing people who have similar interests to come together and, and, and have discussions. Um, I get, we talked about surveys. That's a good thing because, you know, it's, it's data. But the, the key thing here, I, I would say, Ryan, is the idea of, of adopting a feedback growth mindset, that, that, that learning thing, because you want to learn from your employees. You want... You want that back and forth. And, and I think that, that that's by far the most critical. Yeah, I think that seems oh, then, to be and right. And then having an action plan. Then having an action plan. Articulating Perfect. articulating what you've heard. I think that's important. I, I'm sorry. A lot of people, sorry to cut you off there, but a lot no, of people do good. the feedback. A lot of people do the feedback, but then they don't articulate back what they heard or say back what they heard and articulate maybe an action plan or, or, or show what it is that you're thinking of how you can take steps forward based on that feedback. So take the feedback, articulate what you've heard so that everybody understands it and then provide an action plan on, on what you um, anticipate doing. Yeah, no, I think that's right. And I think in, in a lot of, you know, successful remote organizations, you see sort of a, a structure that is a little, I guess, less vertical and a little more shallow, not to say that they don't have a hierarchy, you know, there's still a CEO, there's still those guys, mm -hmm. but in terms of practice, they seem to be much more on the same level as the people that work for them. Right. I mean, everybody's bringing their skills to the table and, and we work together as a team because we have all these different skills, you know, so, but rather than that top level, you know, as you put it, sort of this idea of being the professor at the front of the room, you know, instead of that, you know, I'm not Mr. CEO. Now, maybe my job is to provide a vision and my job is to provide, you know, sort of, you know, employee safety or, you know, enact policy or whatever. But, you know, your jobs are no less important than mine. Our job doesn't work if we're not working together. So I think I think that that makes sense. And, you know, one of the things you were just talking about, actually, the thing you sort of closed on there, this idea of an action plan, what I think it really leans into is this idea of, of transparency, and being transparent. And, you know, transparency is obviously one of these super buzzy words. Like you hear it all the time these days, you know, oh, transparency, <laughs> yeah, transparency. Yeah, yeah. But, um, but I think it's, you know, really a critical idea. And, you know, I've spent a lot of time talking to a lot of people recently about transparency and how we actually impose it. And actually, I think maybe it makes sense to sort of talk a little about that topic here as we sort of wind down. Uh, as it sort of completes our loop, right? We began with sort of a discussion on trust and and empathy and, and these sorts of things as it pertained to this return to work, you know. So maybe now we talk about a little bit of, of what that looks like. You know, now we're back. We're we're you know in the office and working out of the office. We're maybe now in a, a hybrid team, and the way that we're communicating is open and transparent. Do you mind uh, sharing any insights on that? Yeah, as far as transparency goes, again, geez, they just keep popping up. Comfort just keeps popping pop up. I, we need some more um, wide open transparency companies um, to, to pull case studies from. But um, the idea of, of having a really, really good internal marketing strategy, um, I think is really, really important because, you know, just like external marketing, right? You have an external marketing plan. It talks about the highlights, you know, it's informing people of the things that are going on. It's the exact same thing for internal marketing. A lot of companies do not have an internal marketing strategy, you know, like, and, and, and same with, but you have an external marketing strategy and there's a cadence on when you do things. Well, same with internal, you, you really need to kind of like think about that strategy of how you're going to inform and when you're going to inform. 
Um, the other thing is 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 just the idea of of asynchronous versus synchronous. I know a lot of people are hearing a ton about this right now, but the idea of of, of working asynchronously kind of forces you into transparency because you know you're posting something and 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 everyone can view it whenever they can they can view it whenever it's um, convenient to them. So. Um, that's another kind of, you know, important piece in, in, in transparency is having kind of the plan of when and how you're going to communicate, but then also um, kind of acting on it with, with, with different types of tools and stuff. So wikis are really important. The intranets are really important right now. Um, um, you know, project management tools are great. I mean, the project management tools have popped up everywhere over the past few years, you know, the Trello's years ago, um, and those are great because you can actually, if, if used correctly, right, um, you can actually see what's going on with projects and tasks without actually checking on people. So, um, yeah, I would say transparency is critical. And, and in order to really uh, be effective at it, you have to be, you're going to hear this word a lot, intentional, right? You have to come up with an intentional plan so that everybody is on equal, equal level. Kaleem, can I tell you how thrilled to death I am that you said intentional this episode and not me? <laughs> Everybody who has paid attention to this episode or has followed it these last three seasons has heard me say intentional <laughs> in about every episode. And uh, but I think, you know, I mean, it's the word. It's the magic word. Right. And it's how we become more empathetic. It's how we become more deserving of people's trust. It's how we become more transparent. It's it's all these things. Right. So, I mean, it really is mm-hmm. the word of the day. And uh, and so but I'm, I'm grateful somebody besides me said it because uh, I probably sound like I'm <laughs> Uh, beating a drum over here so but me I think- as well, me as well. <laughs> I, I would say wait are you ready you, you want to know remote work all of us remote work um, advocates consultants coaches whatever you want to call us here we go you ready transparency feedback and intentionality done yep that's it that's the whole thing god look at that we solved remote work so, <laughs> Done. I Done. love it. Just like that. Yeah. Now hire us to implement. That'll be the thing. There we go. But uh, no, I, I love that. And, uh, and I think it's really important. You know, I think one of the biggest things, especially on a remote team, but I mean, even in a co-located team or in sort of a traditional environment, you know, being open and transparent, making sure that everybody has sort of alignment around mission and vision and, you know, understanding why we're doing what we're doing. You know, why is it that it matters, you know, is really valuable. Um, you know, I talk a lot about this guy, Chris Doe. He has a company called The Future. And The Future is one of these businesses is very transparent. And he's one of the mm-hmm. examples I, I'm most familiar with. But anyway, I mean, with his employees, they you know, they, they know what a job is worth and how much money is coming in and, and how much their contribution contributed to that and, and that sort of thing. And if sales are down and their numbers are down, then they start going, geez, well, I understand why, you know, my job might be at risk or whatever. And, and they have kind of a dog in the fight, you know? And I think that that's, yeah. I think that's a really important thing, but I think it comes from those three magic words. Right. And, and yeah. so, so I think that's it. Well, so Kaleem, the, the, the last, the oh, one last thing I wanted to say, cause I know we could keep talking forever is, um, the United, who is the U.S.'s largest employer? Do you know? Uh, government, I guess. Good call. Nice. You're correct. And guess whose salaries are all public? Yeah. Government. There you I go. mean, I mean, like, it, it, <laughs> it, 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 it's hilarious, but like, yeah, the government's transparent with salaries, budgets, and all that stuff, right? Yeah. Um, but but we as companies, we feel some kind of way that we can't do that. I just find that very. Yeah. Very well, and I think it goes back. You, you mentioned earlier this idea of having a growth mindset, which, you know, the opposite of is sort of a scarcity mindset. And when you operate from a, a position of being scared or, or that, you know, uh, resources are scarce, then you get into this mode where you really want to kind of keep everything to yourself. Right. You're trying to protect, all, you know, everything you've got. And, uh, and that doesn't allow you to be a very open leader or a very transparent, uh, manager or, or any of this stuff. It sort of hinders your communication and meet, you're always keeping secrets. You're, I mean, you know, it just, it doesn't lend itself to a very good situation. And so I think opening that stuff up and, you know, sure it's a little bit uncomfortable, but the, the more you talk about what you make or the more you talk about your, you know, whatever it, they come more comfortable it gets. And, uh, Absolutely. you know, I mean, people will understand, oh, okay, well you have a PhD and you make more money than my bachelor's degree. Okay. Well, fine. I'm not going to resent you for that. I mean, I understand exactly. you've got more training than yeah. me. You've been here. He's hard. Yeah. You've been here 20 <laughs> years and I just got here, you know, of course you're going to make more than me. Like, I mean, we're, we're not going to resent you for that. So, I mean, right. you know, people, people get a little squirrely when it comes to that stuff, but I, I, I think you're right that it's just, it's gotta, gotta be out there on the table. 
So, and, uh, awesome. you know, and ultimately just to, like I said, close the loop. I mean, that is sort of trust, right? That's empathy. That's the faith right. that we have to put in the people that we work with. That they're not out to get us, that we're all actually here together. And, uh, and if you can open your mind up that way, then there's no reason to force the return back to the office, you know, listen mm-hmm. to your people and, and be truly people first. You know, that's another one of those buzzwords that you hear all the time is we're people first. And, you know, mm-hmm. there's 50 some percent of companies not listening to their people right now. So, so are you truly people first? So, Don't be back to the office required. How about back to the office not required? Yep. I yep. mean, it's, it's I love that. that. Yep. I love that. <laughs> well, hey, Kaleem, in these last couple of minutes, do you want to uh, tell people, uh, the people who've been so kind to, to tune in and join this roller coaster ride with us, um, <laughs> do you mind telling them where they can find out more about you, get involved, or maybe get in touch if they had hoped to, uh, you know, book you for speaking or, or for con- yeah, uh, consult, sure. whatever? Sure. Yeah. Doing a lot of speaking. You can check out um, blendmeinc.com. You can see all of our cool events that we've been doing. And uh, if you're just curious about how your remote employee experience is doing, we have a free remote employee experience assessment that we call TREE. Um, And I'm Kaleem Clarkson everywhere. So K-A-L-E-E-M and then C-L-A-R-K-S-O-N, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn. And then, of course, you mentioned this earlier earlier. We, uh, you, you join us a lot on Clubhouse every Wednesday, 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, we host Remote Work Wednesdays, so you can you can join us there. Yep, that's awesome, Kaleem. And I do want to just make one other little plug for you for everybody who is uh, an active Slack user. The Remotely One community is great. Uh, there's always comments going back and forth, people sharing articles, resources. I, I mean, I've actually uh, hired a couple guys off of there, all kinds of things. So it's a, hey, it's a great resource and uh, it's free. Uh, at last check anyway, I thought, it, I think it's free or at least oh, has yeah. a free option. Yeah. So go over to, uh, to that website, remotely one. What, what's the URL? Uh, remotely one.com. Okay. Yeah. Remotely one.com. And uh, there's a, a button at the top that says apply or apply now and uh, go ahead and get registered and see if you can get into the community because it's a, uh, it's truly valuable. And, you know, as we mentioned in the, the intro at the beginning, it's sort of designed to help reduce isolation and give people a, a channel for communication with other remote working professionals. So uh, it's a great community for people to get involved with. So Kaleem, Thanks for the blog, man. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for doing this, man. I'm grateful to finally sit down and have sort of a long form discussion with you. We've, uh, we've been ships in the night on, uh, on clubhouse and, <laughs> and, uh, and everywhere else it seems like for these last couple of years. So I'm really grateful to have had the time to sit down with you. Awesome, man. Really appreciate being here. Thank you so much. I don't owe you anything. I don't know.